Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Again, let me first state up front that I've thought long and hard about putting pen to paper, as it were. I've never shared this with anyone for obvious reasons, except a little with my wife. Okay, now where to begin? I guess at my earliest memory. I was around five years old. I was a normal child with a great childhood. I was deathly scared of the dark. So I had my little kid routines every night. As silly as they sound now, they helped me back then. I used to get in bed and put my head between two pillows and sucked the covers in around me as tight as I could get. We as kids were never allowed to watch anything horror-related, and in the 70s it wasn't hard to shield your child if you were so inclined so I knew nothing of ghosts, Bigfoot, aliens, etc. I guess that kind of sets the stage. Believe it or not, I'm making this very brief. I could fill books with all the information that I've stored in my memories. <laughs> well, one evening, when I was five, I was laying in bed trying my best to go to sleep. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity. At some point, I got up to go to the bathroom and looked at the clock. It was 2.45 a.m. That number has been burned into my brain. I guess because I've replayed this almost on a daily basis since then. Anyway, I got back in bed, and just as I got situated, my bedroom window lit up bright as the sun. This was back in the days of the aluminum blinds. My bedroom window faced the backyard. We had the largest lot in the neighborhood. Right behind our back fence began a small bayou and then woods. Okay, so the window lights up. I figure my dad had gone out back to check on the animals. We had a problem with possums back then, and dad would go out there from time to time to run them off. So I remember getting out of bed and walking over to my window. At the base of my window was a Raggedy Ann and Andy toy box. I climbed up to be high enough to look out my window. When I peeked through, there was the light. It was bright as daylight, but I don't remember having to squint. Then, there, about 15 feet off the ground, was a craft of some sort. It was massive. It was metallic but dull, kind of oblong and made no noise. I froze looking at it. I was scared to death and relaxed at the same time, but I couldn't get my feet to move. It wasn't threatening at all, just hovered. After a few minutes, the bottom opened and a metal arm came out. It was metal, but flexible, 
almost like the jelly arms that you would sling against the wall as a kid. After it came out, and I guess got in position, it went rigid like you would imagine metal to be. There was a flat end on it, and it projected a red beam. I liken it to a grocery store scanner. It started on the end of the house furthest from me, then went straight across the back of the house and ended up going across my eyes. Once it got to my eyes, it went back and forth across my eyes about three times. Afterward, the arms went to jelly again, went back into the ship, and zoom! It went straight up and over the tree line in an instant, still making no noise. I just stood there wondering, what was that? Will it come back? And where did it go? About then, my mom walks into my room and asked why I was up. She also asked, what was the light? She said she got up to go to the bathroom and walked past my room. She saw me at the window and thought it was weird, since I have a fear of the dark. She then came back into my room after finishing in the bathroom, and that's when she told me to get back in bed and she tucked me back in. I went soundly to sleep after laying there wondering. Afterwards, I never saw it again. But that's when all hell broke loose. I've never taken the time to write any of this down or talk about this. How would I explain it? How would I look? Nuts? I've searched for answers since then, and it has all but consumed my adult life but figured it was my cross to bear for whatever reason. As I grow older, I get more curious. I've had things happen to me since then, if not on a weekly basis, then sometimes on a daily. I'll give two brief examples, and then I can go into much more detail if you'd like. First, in my early 20s, I moved to South Mississippi with three roommates. We rented a double-wide mobile home that was on the property. It was on a gravel road, and there was only one more mobile home on that street. It was right next door, but empty and very run down. The road was about a mile long, and we were in the country. There was only one street lamp, and it was at the entrance to the street. So when I say it got dark, it got dark there at night you could see layers and layers of stars. Stars I couldn't have even imagined. So back then, I still smoked cigarettes, and only smoked outside. So we had beach chairs on the front deck and would sit out there and smoke and just kind of chat about the previous day's events. One night, I and two of my roommates were outside smoking. It was around 10 or 11 at night, I was admiring the stars as usual and, of course, recounting my experiences like I always tended to do, when there were three lights that caught my eye. They weren't as small as a star, but a little smaller than an airplane lights. I knew them very well from watching them, too. But these lights were different. They were going in a circular pattern very fast. Then in an instant, they would shoot off in a straight line then back to circling. Each one would do this. I called my roommate's attention to this, and we watched them for hours. After that, every night they were there, without fail. We would intentionally sit and watch them for hours upon hours. Sometimes there were two. Sometimes there were 14, but always there, and always doing stunts in the air that modern physics would not allow. So one day, I'm at work in the break room, and there's a news report that comes on TV. It was talking about a famous abduction that happened in the area back in the 50s and 60s. There was a book about it and all. I started casually telling a few of my co-workers about the lights. They, of course, didn't believe me and wanted to come see. I invited them over, and we all sat and watched them. Their mouths just hung open, and one was a retired Air Force pilot. He confirmed that what they were doing couldn't or shouldn't have been possible. They'd come over often after that and watch them in awe with us. Fast forward a few weeks. 
my landlord, came by to do some repairs and I happened to talk about the mobile home next door. He told me it had been empty for about four years and that the inside was gutted. There'd been a fire and they just moved out rather than repairing it. This was a Friday. So Saturday comes and he was supposed to come back after he got the materials he needed to make the repair. So around five in the evening, there was a knock on my front door. I was home alone. I went to the door and looked out the window thinking it was my landlord, but it wasn't. It was a very frail, thin, short woman. Her skin color looked as if she'd just stepped off of a Dracula movie set, very pale and ashen. She had to have the worst black wig on that I had ever seen. It obviously didn't fit and was faker than fake could be. She was wearing sunglasses, the kind that you would expect to see on Charlie's Angels. They were right out of the 1970s and big, way too big for her face. How they stayed up on her face, I have no idea. She had the smallest nose, almost like a little button nose, very odd looking. I hadn't seen one like that before or since. I asked through the door if I could help her. She told me she lived next door and wanted to ask me a few things. Well, that's weird. My landlord just told me no one lived there. I then asked her what she'd like to know. She then asked who I had told about the lights in the sky. That sent shivers. Her voice was very monotone, not threatening, just insistent. I asked her what she was talking about. She then repeated the question. I told her no one. She asked the question again. I then was totally creeped out. I told her I'm sorry, but I was in the middle of something and couldn't talk. She continued to ask and then would knock. Ask, then knock. This lasted for well over two hours. Then it stopped as quickly as it started. I then looked out all my windows. She was nowhere to be found. I even walked into the front yard. No one. She never came back. But there were three other occasions that we heard someone tapping on our windows. But when we looked outside, there was no one. Lastly, and and please understand that I'm only writing one one one-hundredth of my experiences, the dreams. Since I had the experience as a child, I have had dreams. Some weeks they were every night, then others once a week, but they have never gone. I've woken with marks, bruises, small puncture holes, blood on my sheets, etc. My wife has seen them on many occasions. 99% would start by these sometimes two, sometimes five figures that would walk straight out of my bedroom wall to the side of my bed. They're always the same. Just the number of them change. My wife explains it best. She says, they take me, but not my full mortal body, to places. I've asked them questions. They've told me things. For example, I once asked, why aren't your ships seen? With all the people in the world, I figured it'd be a good question, right? The response was, because we cloak. We can be clouds or anything we'd like. They told me about the moon. Told me about Platus before I even knew what or where that was. I've seen other people there as well. We never talk to each other or even acknowledge each other, but they are there. Usually it's about three to ten other people. I could write books for days about this stuff. About eight months ago, I guess I was with them, and they told me I was remembering too much. Afterwards, I would know I had a dream, but it was almost like a firewall of sorts. It now comes to me in bits and pieces, and they have been progressing from that's weird to are you freaking kidding me? I can go more in depth or answer any questions if you feel the need. I know I sound like I'm completely mad, and there is the reason why I have never done this before. 
This truly has been a living hell for me. I'm a very inquisitive person, and to me there is always an answer for everything. Except this. I have no answers. Just more questions. Why me? What did I do? Why was I chosen for this crap? Can't I just have a normal life like everyone else? I guess not. I've researched until I'm blue in the face. And now, I guess I now look like a complete nutball. Either way, this has been very therapeutic for me. Even though I didn't really even scratch the surface, it feels like the weight of the world has been lifted. My wife tries to help, but God love her, she truly doesn't understand either. So when I tell her, I feel as if I'm beating my head against a wall. Thank you for listening. And I'm very sorry to be so long-winded, but that's my little life. I'm sure this is full of typos, but I was just kind of letting it flow out to give you an idea of what has happened and continues to happen. As crazy as this all sounds, trust me, I think it's just as crazy. Hey Weirdos! Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this Saturday, August 17th, with Weirdo family favorite Mistress Malicious and her crew from Mistress Peace Theater. This time, Mistress is bringing us a film from 2015 entitled Killer Piñata. A possessed piñata seeking to avenge the savagery that humanity has inflicted on his kind picks off a group of friends one by one in an unending night of terror. I'm going to take a wild guess and say this is more comedy and less creeps, but we'll find out. The fun begins this Saturday night, August 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch. Just tune in at showtime and watch the movie with me and other Weirdo family members, and even join in the chat during the film for more fun. It's Mistress Malicious presenting Killer Piñata, this Saturday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV. See you Saturday! When I was 12 years old, my family lived in an old house in Texas. It was a four-bedroom house. I shared my room with my baby sister, and my brother and parents had their own rooms. The last room was used as an office. Every night, when everyone went to sleep, they would close their doors except for my room. I don't know why, I just didn't like my door closed. We had an extremely long, dark hallway. One night, when I was the only one awake, I was watching TV as usual when I saw a tall male figure in the corner of my eye peek into my room, and when I turned to look, he would back up and hide. For some reason, I didn't really feel bothered by it, so I just kept watching TV and once again I could see him peek in out of my room, and every time I would look, he would disappear. Eventually I just fell asleep because it was so late. On this one evening I was in the kitchen making food, and from my kitchen you can see the hallway. While I was making my food in the corner of my eye I saw the tall shadow man again, just peeking and I couldn't really see his face, but every time I would turn to look, he would disappear, but he would always reappear every time I would not look in his direction. It was so weird and creepy, but I didn't feel afraid. Finally, one night everyone was asleep, except for my brother, who had his girlfriend over, so their door was cracked open 
and there was light shining into my room. Well, I was asleep and for some reason something woke me up. When I opened my eyes, there was a clear view of a man in my room staring into the hallway. He didn't look at me. He looked like he was hiding from someone. He seemed worried and scared. I was so shocked I could not move. I was seriously on stuck mode. Eventually, I snapped out of it and turned my lamp on, and when I did, he turned and looked at me and slowly vanished. I was so spooked, I slept the rest of the night with my lights on. They say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but not, apparently, when it comes to the happenings at the Luxor. Here are two accounts of ghostly experiences by people who stayed there. We begin with a review of the hotel on TripAdvisor. Me and my 18-month-old son stayed in room 19207. Let me start off by saying my son is a great baby and is very loving and never gives me a hard time. We arrived on Monday. Our suite was amazing and we loved it. As soon as I unpacked, my son started to act unlike himself. He was biting me, hitting me, and pulling my hair. He tried to scratch my eyes out. He started to hit himself, pull his own chair and eyelashes. He pulled his ears and bit himself. Then he tried to destroy the room. I mean, he threw everything on the floor. My mother stayed in another suite, and my son was violent to her also. I dismissed it due to the fact that I thought he was sleepy because he was awake the whole drive there. Bedtime came around, and I pulled the covers down to put my son into bed at about 8.30 p.m. As I did so, there was a fresh blood stain on my sheets. I was horrified. I called the front desk about 8.40, but the maid didn't get there until after 10 p.m. When she came to my room, she said she was so sorry that she didn't come faster. She was hoping someone else was going to come because she didn't like that particular hotel room. I paid no mind to the comment. I thanked her, and she went on her way. I went to sleep about midnight, and I had a dream that a blonde woman was trying to take over my body. I woke up because it felt so real. It felt like I couldn't breathe. It was about 2 a.m., and I was saying a prayer. I felt someone sit on my bed. It was horrible. My heart started to race, and I prayed more. I just thought my mind was playing tricks on me. Tuesday morning, my son woke up the same violent way he was acting on Monday. He wouldn't eat anything while we were in the room. We proceeded to go sightseeing and so forth. About 7 p.m., my son and I went to my mother's room on the 22nd floor. We came back down about 8 p.m. Again, I got my son ready for bed, and he waited on the bed for me while I used the restroom. As soon as I opened the door, there was the blonde woman going through my clothes that were hung up in the closet. She turned her head and gave me the most evil look. I closed the door quickly. I had a horrible, eerie feeling. I was sick to my stomach. The small hairs on my body were standing up. I ran to my son, ran to the living room and looked for the phone but realized my son put the cordless phone in the bedroom. I went in there to get the phone and although she never showed herself to me again, I felt her. I felt like I couldn't breathe and my heart was racing. I can't explain how I felt, but I was terrified of the feeling that spirit gave me. So I called the front desk. They got me out of that room, upgrading me to a bigger suite. The two more days we stayed there, my son was himself again. He was loving, kind, and he ate so much. Back to being my well-behaved son. I really liked how the Luxor got me out of that room almost within 10 minutes. 
They even packed my stuff because I refused to go back into the bedroom. I'm not sure I will ever go back there, but I did like it the remainder of my stay. I'm just thankful my son is okay. They have great food and great attractions. I did try to ask around to see if someone was murdered, but a local told me that they do not disclose that to the public because of a bad rep. So if you stay there, stay away from the 19th floor. 19207 to be exact. A reviewer on Yelp also had a few things to say. If someone flags this review, I will be very pissed off. I'm not kidding. I didn't watch any horror movie, we weren't drunk, and I'm not that imaginative either. I'm Asian, and yes, the supernatural exists. Go to Bali if you don't trust me. And what happened here is still somewhat nothing compared to Bali. I got the spa suite a week ago. To be precise, it's room 12860. It was our first night in Vegas, so when we saw the room, we thought it was okay. But as soon as we moved to Caesar's Palace and Hard Rock, that room was shit. Still better and cheaper than the MGM, though. Here's the problem. Believe it or not, this hotel, especially this room, is haunted. Laugh if you want. I don't care. I'm writing this review for those of you who are sensitive so that you won't be attacked here. The suite consists of the living room and the bedroom with spa. I slept in the living room and nothing happened to me, probably because I sleep so deep, but those who slept in the bedroom were attacked the whole night. My sister slept next to the spa and it was dry, we cleaned it out. There were no sounds for like hours, but around 3 a.m. the water started to pour and stop and pour and stop just like someone was teasing her. Her blanket was pulled down little by little. It just doesn't make sense at all for a blanket to go down at an interval like that. She grabbed back the blanket and she felt someone pulling it down. As soon as she grabbed it, something grabbed her leg and pulled her down. She struggled and kicked, but there was nothing to kick. Suddenly, everything just stopped. The next bed is located far from the spa. Twin sisters of my girlfriend heard the sound of cell phone interference through a speaker. We didn't put our cell phones next to the bed and there were no speakers at all near them. The final blow here is that one of the twins was physically twisted the other way around by a force like she was pushed to roll over. Two reviews that might give you pause to stay at the Luxor Hotel in Vegas or perhaps give you incentive, depending on your tastes. This all started back in the summer of 1965. It was a hot August day. My eldest brother and I were home and were about to make some lunch. We started making lunch and about 20 minutes passed before we heard a knock on the front door. My brother said, go see who that is. So I go and open the door, but no one was there. I closed it and walked back telling him nobody was there. So he just said okay and he continued to make sandwiches while I made the soup. Tomato soup, to be exact. Some time went by when again we heard a knock at the front door. Again, he asked me to go see who it was, so I go to see who it is, and again, no one is there. I went back and told him. He said, okay, go over and open the front door so whoever's doing this will find out. I did, as he asked, and went back to making lunch. About 15 minutes went by when all of a sudden there was a loud knocking at the door. Knowing the door was open, this kind of surprised us. As we went to look, my brother passed by the wall that had the thermostat on it. He looked at it and saw the temperature was dropping. Now, let me remind you, this all happened in the month of August, the hottest month of the year, and we didn't have air conditioning at that time. We both watched the temperature drop, and then all of a sudden we heard this 
god-awful banging coming from the closet door adjacent to the front door. We stood there and, again, the banging happened, this time with more force than I think I could ever do. You could see the door flexing and shaking from the violent banging. Then the door flies open, hangers, coats, and jackets started flying out of the closet. Some of the hangers, I kid you not, stuck in the far wall. We both were mesmerized by what was happening. Finally, my brother says, we need to get out of here. We both ran out the back door and got into his car and drove off. He and I were so scared. We didn't go back until a couple of hours later. By then, we decided to go back and as we did, we both felt a calmness like all the energy was gone. He said, well, the only thing to do now is go in and clean up the mess. I told him, nope, no way, I ain't going back in there. He said, okay, and went in. He called out and said everything was clear, so reluctantly, I go back and felt nothing in the air. The house was hot again. The thing with this is, and I know it's true, before we moved into the house back in 1961, there was a family of Mexicans living there before us, and the grandfather died in the house. The room I used to sleep in was his room, and from time to time, I would see a shadow going across the wall, going out of the room. Later in my life, I started doing paranormal investigating, at age 14 to be exact. I've been doing this ever since for the past 47 years. Back in 1965, I was scared. Now, nothing scares me in the realm of the paranormal. I look forward to looking behind the next door. I know some people will say this is all made up. I'm here to tell you this is a true story. It did happen, and I will stake my life on it. I was about six years old, and my parents had just moved us into a new house. From the first visit, I never felt comfortable in that house, and still, 15 years later, I hate being there alone. The first couple of months after moving in, we had a few incidents. Keys would go missing, electricity would cut, creaks and bangs on the walls, but my parents reassured me that it was just because it was a new house and we weren't used to its personality yet. One night, I was woken by a feeling of being very cold. I sat up and opened my eyes, and there was a figure standing in my doorway. The only way I can describe it is that it was like death, but all white. It had no face, just an unimaginably dark space where a face should be, long, long arms which had no skin but exposed muscle and skeletal hands. It took me a second to register what I was seeing. I wasn't scared, just extraordinarily sad. The figure made its way over to my bed, sat down and stroked the top of my head. While it was brushing the hair from my face, it leant close in to me and said, I know you then quickly got up and sped out of my room and down our stairs. I'm really curious to see if anyone has had this same experience. It's something that has stayed with me ever since, causing what seemed like a downward spiral of ever-increasing paranormal experiences. I was unemployed several years ago and spent much of my time watching TV. I never had anything paranormal happen to me before. This took place at around 4 to 5 in the afternoon. I wasn't alone as my mother was just a few feet away from me on the couch. Everything was quite normal until I noticed a cross which was hanging just above the TV and had been for years started to move, slowly at first, then more violently. It was like someone had pushed it hard or like it had been jolted, 
This cross was heavy. There's no possibility of wind moving it or anything. It takes some force to make the thing move. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human. Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Bedtime is supposed to be a happy event for a tired child. For me, it was terrifying. While some children might complain about being put to bed before they have finished watching a film or playing their favorite video game, when I was a child, nighttime was something to truly fear. Somewhere in the back of my mind, it still is. As someone who's trained in the sciences, I cannot prove that what happened to me was objectively real, but I can swear that what I experienced was genuine horror. A fear which, in my life, I'm glad to say, has never been equaled. I will relate it to you all now as best I can, make of it what you will, but I'll be glad to just get it off my chest. I can't remember exactly when it started, but my apprehension towards falling asleep seemed to correspond with my being moved into a room of my own. I was eight years old at the time, and until then I had shared a room, quite happily, with my older brother. As is perfectly understandable, for a boy five years my senior, my brother eventually wished for a room of his own, and as a result, I was given the room at the back of the house. It was a small, narrow, yet oddly elongated room, large enough for a bed and a couple of chests of drawers, but not much else. I couldn't really complain because, even at that age, I understood that we did not have a large house and I had no real cause to be disappointed, as my family was both loving and caring. It was a happy childhood. During the day. A solitary window looked out onto our back garden nothing out of the ordinary, but even during the day, the light which crept into that room seemed almost hesitant. As my brother was given a new bed, I was given the bunk beds which we used to share. While I was upset about sleeping on my own, I was excited at the thought of being able to sleep in the top bunk, which seemed far more adventurous to me. From the very first night, I remember a strange feeling of unease creeping slowly from the back of my mind. I lay on the top bunk, staring down at my action figures and cars strewn across the green-blue carpet. 
As imaginary battles and adventures took place between the toys on the floor, I couldn't help but feel that my eyes were being slowly drawn towards the bottom bunk, as if something was moving in the corner of my eye, something which did not wish to be seen. The bunk was empty, impeccably made with a dark blue blanket tucked in neatly, partially covering two rather bland white pillows. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I was a child, and the noise slipping under my door from my parents' television bathed me in a warm sense of safety and well-being. I fell asleep. When you awaken from a deep sleep to something moving or stirring, it can take a few moments for you to truly understand what's happening. The fog of sleep hangs over your eyes and ears, even when lucid. Something was moving, there was no doubt about that. At first, I wasn't sure what it was. Everything was dark, almost pitch black, but there was enough light creeping in from outside to outline that narrowly suffocating room. Two thoughts appeared in my mind almost simultaneously. The first was that my parents were in bed because the rest of the house lay both in darkness and silence. The second thought turned to the noise, a noise which had obviously woken me. As the last cobwebs of sleep withered from my mind, the noise took on a more familiar form. Sometimes the simplest of sounds can be the most unnerving. A cold wind whistling through a tree outside, a neighbor's footsteps uncomfortably close, or in this case, the simple sound of bedsheets rustling in the dark. That was it. Bedsheets rustling in the dark, as if some disturbed sleeper was attempting to get all too comfortable in the bottom bunk. I lay there in disbelief, thinking that the noise was either my imagination or perhaps just my pet cat finding somewhere comfortable to spend the night. It was then that I noticed my door, shut as it had been as I'd fallen asleep. Perhaps my mom had checked in on me and the cat had sneaked into my room then. Yes, that must have been it. I turned to face the wall, closing my eyes in the vain hope that I could fall back to sleep. As I moved, the rustling noise from underneath me ceased. I thought that I must have disturbed my cat, but quickly I realized that the visitor in the bottom bunk was much less mundane than my pet trying to sleep, and much more sinister. As if alerted to and disgruntled by my presence, the disturbed sleeper began to toss and turn violently, like a child having a tantrum in their bed. I could hear the sheets twist and turn with increasing ferocity. Fear then gripped me, not like the subtle sense of unease I had experienced earlier, but now potent and terrifying. My heart raced as my eyes panicked, scanning the almost impenetrable darkness. I let out a cry. As most young boys do, I instinctively shouted for my mother. I could hear something stir on the other side of the house, but as I began to breathe a sigh of relief that my parents were coming to save me, the bunk beds suddenly started to shake violently as if gripped by an earthquake, scraping against the wall. I could hear the sheets below me thrashing around as if tormented by malice. I did not want to jump down to safety as I feared the thing in the bottom bunk would reach out and grab me, pulling me into the darkness. So I stayed there, white knuckles clenching my own blanket like a shroud of protection. The wait seemed like an eternity. The door finally and thankfully burst open and I lay bathed in light while the bottom bunk, the resting place of my unwanted visitor, lay empty and peaceful. I cried and my mother consoled me. Tears of fear followed by relief streamed down my face. Yet through all of the horror and relief, I did not tell her why I was so upset. I cannot explain it, but it was as though whatever had been in that bunk would return if I even so much as spoke of it, or uttered a single syllable of its existence. Whether that was true, I do not know, but as a child, I felt as if that unseen menace remained close 
listening. My mother lay in the empty bunk promising to stay there until morning. Eventually, my anxiety diminished, tiredness pushed me back towards sleep, but I remained restless, waking several times momentarily to the sound of rustling bedsheets. I remember the next day wanting to go anywhere, be anywhere but in that narrow, suffocating room. It was a Saturday, and I played outside, quite happily, with my friends. Although our house was not large, we were lucky enough to have a long, sloping garden in the back. We played there often, as much of it was overgrown and we could hide in the bushes, climb in the huge sycamore tree which towered above all else, and easily imagine ourselves in the throes of a grand adventure in some untamed exotic land. As fun as it all was, occasionally my eye would turn to that small window, ordinary, slight, and innocuous. But for me, that thin boundary was a looking glass into a strange, cold pocket of dread. Outside the lush green surroundings of our garden filled with the smiling faces of my friends could not extinguish the creeping feeling clawing its way up my spine, each hair standing on end. The feeling of something in that room, watching me play, watching for the night when I would be alone, eagerly filled with hate. It may sound strange to you, but by the time my parents ushered me back into that room for the night, I said nothing. I didn't protest. I didn't even make an excuse as to why I couldn't sleep there. I simply and sullenly walked into that room, climbed the few steps into the top bunk, and then waited. As an adult, I would be telling everyone about my experience. But even at that age, I felt almost silly to be talking about something which I really had no evidence for. I would be lying, however, if I said this was my primary reason. I still felt that this thing would be enraged if I so much as spoke of it. It's funny how certain words can remain hidden from your mind, no matter how blatant or obvious they are. One word came to me that second night, lying there in the darkness alone. Frightened, aware of a rotten change in the atmosphere, a thickening of the air as if something had displaced it. As I heard the first casual twists of the bedsheets below, the first anxious increase of my heartbeat at the realization that something was once again in the bottom bunk, that word, a word which had been sent into exile, filtered up through my consciousness, breaking free of all repression, gasping for air, screaming, etching, and carving itself into my mind ghost. As this thought came to me, I noticed that my unwelcome visitor had ceased moving. The bedsheets lay calm and dormant, but they'd been replaced by something far more hideous. A slow, rhythmic, rasping breath heaved and escaped from the thing below. I could imagine its chest rising and falling with each sordid, wheezing, and garbled breath, I shuddered and hoped beyond all hope that it would leave without occurrence. The house lay, as it had the previous night, in a thick blanket of darkness. Silence prevailed, all but for the perverted breath of my as-yet-unseen bunkmate. I lay there terrified. I just wanted this thing to go, to leave me alone. What did it want? Then something unmistakably chilling transpired. It moved. It moved in a way different from before. When it threw itself around in the bottom bunk, it seemed unrestrained, without purpose, almost animalistic. This movement, however, was driven by awareness, with purpose, with a goal in mind. For that thing lying there in the darkness that thing which seemed intent on terrorizing a young boy, calmly and nonchalantly sat up. Its labored breathing had become louder, as now only a mattress and a few flimsy wooden slats separated my body from the unearthly breath below. I lay there, my eyes filled with tears, 
a fear which words cannot relate to you or anyone else coursed through my veins. I would not have believed that this fear could have been heightened, but I was wrong. I imagined what this thing would look like, sitting there listening from below my mattress, hoping to catch the slightest hint that I was awake. Imagination then turned to an unnerving reality. It began to touch the wooden slats which my mattress sat on. It seemed to caress them carefully, running what I imagined to be fingers and hands across the surface of the wood. Then, with great force, it prodded angrily between two slats into the mattress. Even through the padding, it felt as though someone had viciously stuck their fingers into my side. I let out an almighty cry and the wheezing, shaking and moving thing in the bunk below replied in kind by violently vibrating the bunk as it had done the night before. Small flakes of paint powdered onto my blanket from the wall as the frame of the bed scraped along it, backwards and forwards. Once again I was bathed in light and there stood my mother, loving, caring as she always was, with a comforting hug and calming words which eventually subdued my hysteria. Of course she asked what was wrong, but I could not say. I dared not say. I simply said one word over and over and over again. Nightmare. This pattern of events continued for weeks, if not months. Night after night, I would awaken to the sound of rustling sheets. Each time I would scream so as to not provide this abomination with time to prod and feel for me. With each cry, the bed would shake violently, stopping with the arrival of my mother, who would spend the rest of the night in the bottom bunk, seemingly unaware of the sinister force torturing her son nightly. Along the way, I managed to feign illness a few times and come up with other less-than-truthful reasons for sleeping in my parents' bed, but more often than not, I would be alone for the first few hours of each night in that place, the room where the light from outside did not sit right, alone with that thing. With time, you can become desensitized to almost anything, no matter how horrific. I had come to realize that, for whatever reason, this thing could not harm me when my mother was present. I'm sure the same would have been said for my father, but as loving as he was, waking him from sleep was almost impossible. After a few months, I had grown accustomed to my nightly visitor. Do not mistake this for some unearthly friendship. I detested the thing. I still feared it greatly, as I could almost sense its desires and its personality, if you could call it that, one filled with a perverted and twisted hatred yet longing for me of perhaps all things. My greatest fears were realized in the winter. The days grew short, and the longer nights merely provided this wretch with more opportunities. It was a difficult time for my family. My grandmother, a wonderfully kind and gentle woman, had deteriorated greatly since the death of my grandfather. My mother was trying her best to keep her in the community as long as possible. However, dementia is a cruel and degenerative illness robbing a person of their memories one day at a time. Soon, she recognized none of us, and it became clear that she would need to be moved from her house to a nursing home. Before she could be moved, my grandmother had a particularly difficult few nights, and my mother decided that she would stay with her. As much as I loved my grandmother and felt nothing but anguish at her illness, to this day, I feel guilty that my first thoughts were not of her, but of what my nightly visitor may do should it be aware of my mother's absence, her presence being the one thing which I was sure was protecting me from the full horror of this thing's reach. I rushed home from school that day. It immediately wrenched the bed sheets and mattress from the lower bunk, removing all of the slats and placing an old desk a chest of drawers, and some chairs which we kept in a cupboard where the bottom bunk used to be. I told my father I was making an office, which he found adorable, but I would be damned if I'd give that thing a place to sleep for one more night. 
As darkness approached, I lay there knowing my mother was not in the house. I did not know what to do. My only impulse was to sneak into her jewelry box and take a small family crucifix which I had seen there before. While my family were not very religious, at that age I still believed in God and hoped that somehow this would protect me. Although fearful and anxious, while gripping the crucifix under my pillow tightly in one hand, sleep eventually came and I drifted off to dream. I hoped that I would awaken in the morning without incidents. Unfortunately, that night was the most terrifying of all. I woke gradually. The room was once again dark. As my eyes adjusted, I could gradually make out the window and the door, and the walls, some toys on a shelf, and even to this day I shudder to think of it, for there was no noise, no rustling of sheets, no movement at all. The room felt lifeless, lifeless yet not empty. The nightly visitor, that unwelcome, wheezing, hate-filled thing which had terrorized me night after night was not in the bottom bunk. It was in my bed. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. Utter terror had shaken the very sound from my voice. I lay motionless. If I could not scream, I did not want to let it know that I was awake. I had not yet seen it. I could only feel it. It was obscured under my blanket. I could see its outline and I could feel its presence, but I dared not look. The weight of it pressed down on top of me, a sensation I will never forget. When I say that hours passed, I do not exaggerate. Laying there motionless in the darkness, I was every bit a scared and frightened young boy. If it had been during the summer months, it would have been light by then. But the grasp of winter is long and unrelenting and I knew it would be hours before sunrise, a sunrise which I yearned for. I was a timid child by nature, but I reached a breaking point, a moment where I could wait no more, where I could survive under this intimately deviant abomination no longer. Fear can sometimes wear you out, make you threadbare, a shell of nerves leaving only the slightest trace of you behind. I had to get out of that bed, Then I remembered the crucifix. My hand still lay underneath the pillow, but it was empty. I slowly moved my wrist around to find it, minimizing as best I could the sound and vibrations caused, but it could not be found. I had either knocked it off the top bunk or it had, I could not even bear to think of it, been taken from my hand. Without the crucifix, I lost any sense of hope. Even at such a young age, you can be acutely aware of what death is and intensely frightened of it. I knew I was going to die in that bed if I lay there, dormant, passive, doing nothing. I had to leave that room behind, but how? Should I leap from the bed and hope that I make it to the door? What if it's faster than me? Or should I slowly slip out of that top bunk, hoping to not disturb my uncanny bedfellow? Realizing that it had not stirred when I moved, trying to find the crucifix, I began to have the strangest of thoughts. What if it was asleep? It hadn't so much as breathed since I'd woken up. Perhaps it was resting, believing that it had finally got me, that I was finally in its grasp. Or perhaps it was toying with me, After all, it had been doing just that for countless nights, and now, with me under it pinned against my mattress with no mother to protect me, maybe it was holding off, savoring its victory until the last possible moment. Like a wild animal savoring its prey. I tried to breathe as shallowly as possible, and mustering every ounce of courage I could, I reached over slowly with my right hand and began to peel the blanket off of me. What I found under those covers almost stopped my heart. I did not see it, but as my hand moved the blanket, it brushed against something, something smooth 
and cold, something which felt unmistakably like a gaunt hand. I held my breath in terror as I was sure it must now have known that I was awake. Nothing. It did not stir. It felt dead. After a few moments, I placed my hand carefully further down the blanket and felt a thin, poorly formed forearm. My confidence and almost twisted sense of curiosity grew as I moved down further to a disproportionately larger bicep muscle. The arm was outstretched, lying across my chest, with the hand resting on my left shoulder as if it had grabbed me in my sleep. I realized that I would have to move this cadaverous appendage if I even so much as hoped to escape its grasp. For some reason, the feeling of torn, ragged clothing on the shoulder of this nighttime invader stopped me in my tracks. Fear once again swelled in my stomach and in my chest as I recoiled my hand in disgust at the touch of straggled, oily hair. I could not bring myself to touch its face, although I wonder to this very day what it would have felt like. Dear God, it moved! It moved! It it was subtle, but its grip on my shoulder and across my body strengthened. No tears came, but God how I wanted to cry. As its hand and arm slowly coiled around me, my right leg brushed along the cool wall which the bed lay against. Of all that happened to me in that room, this was the strangest. I realized that this clutching, rancid thing which drew great delight from violating a young boy's bed was not entirely on top of me. It was sticking out from the wall like a spider striking from its lair. Suddenly its grip moved from a slow tightening to a sudden squeeze. It pulled and clawed at my clothes as if frightened that the opportunity would soon pass. I fought against it, but its emaciated arm was too strong for me. Its head rose up, writhing and contorting under the blanket. I now realized where it was taking me. Into the wall. I fought for my dear life. I cried, and suddenly my voice returned to me, yelling, screaming, but no one came. When I realized why it was so eager to suddenly strike, why this thing had to have me now, through my window, that window which seemed to represent so much malice from outside, streaked hope, the first rays of sunshine. I struggled further, knowing that if I could just hold on, it would soon be gone. As I fought for my life, the unearthly parasite shifted, slowly pulling itself up my chest, its head now poking out from under the blanket, wheezing, coughing, rasping. I do not remember its features, I simply remember its breath against my face, foul and cold as ice. As the sun broke over the horizon, that dark place, that suffocating room of contempt, was washed, bathed in sunlight. I passed out as its scrawny fingers encircled my neck, squeezing the very life from me. I awoke to my father offering to make me some breakfast. A wonderful sight, indeed. I had survived the most horrible experience of my life until then and now. I moved the bed away from the wall, leaving behind the furniture I had believed would stop that thing from taking a bed. Little did I think that it would try to take mine and me. Weeks passed without incidents. Yet one cold, frostbitten night, I awoke to the sound of the furniture where the bunk beds used to be vibrating violently. In a moment it passed. I lay there, sure I could hear a distant wheezing coming from deep within the wall, finally fading into the distance. I've never told anyone this story before. To this day I still break out in a cold sweat at the sound of bedsheets rustling in the night, or a wheeze brought on by a common cold, and I certainly never sleep with my bed against a wall. Call it superstition, if you will. But as I said, I cannot discount conventional explanations such as sleep paralysis, hallucination, or that of an overactive imagination. But what I can say is this. The following year, 
I was given a larger room on the other side of the house, and my parents took that strangely suffocating, elongated place as their bedroom. They didn't need a large room, just one big enough for a bed and a few things. They lasted ten days. We moved on the 11th. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>